Hello everybody. I am so happy that you chose to join us today. We are on article number 11, The Perseverance of Saints. Our author writes, we believe that such only are real believers as endure until the end, that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors that a special providence watches over their welfare, and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. And guess what? We are off the scenic route and back to our main scripture, which is John the 8th chapter, verses 31 and 32. And it reads, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And so our focus, uh, if you remember, it is on the latter part of verse 32, and the truth will set you free. And our last freedom is found in Romans the 8th chapter, verses 31 and 32, which is freedom from fear. Uh, Romans, the 8th chapter, verses 31 through 39, and this is the NIV version. I will say on the front end that it's lengthy, but hang with me. It says, What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, gracio graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charges against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so we have said, that the eighth chapter of Romans is the Christian's declaration of freedom. Paul declared that as Christians, we enjoy four special freedoms because of our union with Christ. He said that we are not condemned because we're free from judgment. We have no obligation to the flesh or, or simply put, we are not slaves to the flesh because we have the freedom from defeat. The Spirit of God enables us to overcome the flesh. There is no frustration because we have freedom from discouragement. We share the glory of God and our hope is grounded in the return of Christ. And our last freedom is freedom from fear. First, we can answer, ask the question, what is fear? I have several definitions from different dictionaries. One says that it is an unpleasant, strong emotion caused by anticipation or awareness of danger. Then another one says that it is a distressing emotion aroused by impending danger, evil, pain, etc whether the threat is real or imagined. And finally, another dictionary says, it is an unpleasant emotion or thought that you have when you are frightened or worried by something dangerous, painful, or bad, 
that is happening or might happen. So that said, we can agree that fear is an emotion and it's an emotion that we all have experienced at one time or another. The thing about fear is that it can be real or it can be imagined, but the effects is the same. Fear is, is, can be oftentimes paralyzing if we let it. It, it. it will prevent us from doing what we ought to do. And in fact, fear will prevent us from living a full life. According to psychologists, uh, they said that we are born with two fears. That's fear of falling and fear of noise. But it doesn't take long for us to develop many more fears. We, we live in a time where our world is just full of fears. It's part of our attire. It fits nicely as a lapel on even the most expensive outfit. One thing we can be sure of is that that kind of fear is not of God. Christ came to deliver us from fear. You ever notice in the Bible, whenever there's a, a heavenly appearance, the first thing they say is fear not. Why? because we would fear. I, I think that it is because we are bent uh, toward fear. Uh, our first inclination uh, when something stirs us, uh, makes us, when, when something stirs us, it makes us fearful. But 2 Timothy 1 and 7, and this is the King James Version, says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So our fearfulness does not come from God. Now I hear you thinking, wait a minute, God commanded us to fear. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. The Bible does speak of two kinds of fear. One kind is commanded, and it's said that we should fear God. This kind of fear involves respect, honor, reverence, and, and, and a sense of awe. Uh, you remember in Deuteronomy, when Moses is reviewing the law for the people uh, before he goes off the scene, Deuteronomy 6 and 24 in the NIV version says, uh, he being Moses, says, the Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God so that we might always prosper and be kept alive as it is in the case today. And, and so, and then during Saul's coronation, Samuel instructed the people to fear the Lord. In 1 Samuel, the 12th chapter, verse 24, again the NIV, Samuel says, But be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things he has done for you. Then the psalmist instructs us to fear. In, in, in Psalms, uh, in the 33rd Psalms, verse 8, it says, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. So this kind of fear leads to holiness. And it leads to a sense of awe. Uh, a short while after uh, Paul's conversion, the church had a time of peace. Acts 9.31, the NIV says, Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. And finally, we're instructed in Philippians 2 and 12, 
It, it says to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, I should place an insert here that Paul was not instructing the Philippians church to work for their salvation because these folk were already saved. Paul was instructing them to be all that they could be in the Lord, which would require some work on their part. And, and so, you know, we've all seen people with great potential, and, and we may even be one of those people, but they or us never worked it out, never did anything with the potential that we had. God's purpose is for us to achieve Christ-likeness, to be conformed to the image of his son. God will help us to work it out, but we must do our part. So the command to fear the Lord involves respect and reference. Then there's a second kind of fear spoken of in the Bible. And it's the kind of fear that we're most familiar with. This kind of fear it is, is the fear that is forbidden. We're, we're talking about dread, anxiety, apprehension, terror, distrust. All those things, they, they are not good for us. And God commands us not to do that kind of fear. The psalmist speaks to our fear. In the 91st Psalm, verse 5 and 6, he says, You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrows that fly by day, nor the pestilence that stalk in the darkness, nor the plagues that destroy at midday. Jesus also speaks to our fear. In Luke, the 12th chapter, verse 32, and this is the King James Version, he says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Again, I should insert a note here to say, to not fear is not to say don't be cautious. You wouldn't just walk out in the street without looking and say, well, I don't have any fear. No, that would not be smart. Fear of being hit by a car will cause us to look both ways before we cross the street. That would be foolish. And, and that's not, it, it would be foolish to just step out in the road. And, and that is not what we are calling being fearful. Fear is a tool of Satan. And it's an effective one. After Jesus was crucified, the disciples were extremely fearful. Instead of anticipating his resurrection, they were hiding behind locked doors, fearing that the officials would arrest them too. And so, but see, seeing the resurrected Savior made them fearless. So they went from fear to fearless. Uh, in Acts, the third chapter, after Peter and John uh, healed the crippled beggar uh, before going into the temple, the man was about 40 years old, was over 40 years old, and he had been crippled since birth, and he was carried daily to the temple gate to beg folk for money. He, he would beg folk. He was, it was like he was right outside the church, and so as folk go into the church, they would see him. So he probably worked on their sympathy and got more money. And, and But Peter and John, instead of giving him money, Peter healed him. He, he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up. And, and so after, the, after being healed, the man went into the temple with them. Well, he didn't just walk in the temple. He went in the temple jumping and, and, and probably praising God loudly and, and walking all over the place because this man had never been able to walk before. So who could blame him? 
he he was excited. He was praising God. He was jumping. He was walking. He was like, oh, I, I got legs. And when the people saw him, they came to Peter and John wondering what had happened. And, and so remember this, this same Peter who along with John and the other disciples had hid behind locked doors out of fear. They were afraid of some of these same folks. Some of these same folk had, had been uh, uh, probably in that crowd hollering crucify him. Now in boldness, these, these men who had gone from fearful to fearless, and not only fearless, but they had some boldness with it. They, they said to the people, we didn't do this, but the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and check this out. They said, whom you disowned before Pilate and handed him over to be killed. Pilate was willing to let him go had decided to let him go. But the people, he, he, Peter goes on to say that they had disowned the holy and righteous one and had asked for a murderer to be released. And, and so this is bold. Peter is saying, y'all chose a murderer over the holy and righteous one. And, and he said, and you, y'all caused him to, to be crucified in essence for teaching about, uh, well, Peter, I'm sorry, Peter and John were arrested uh, for teaching about the resurrected Jesus. And, and so they were put in jail until the next day. Now, don't forget, we are talking about freedom from fear. And, and we're looking at how Peter and John and the rest of the disciples, even though we're not talking about them right now, went from being fearful to fearless. So after spending the night in jail, you would think that Peter and John were ready to tone it down some, you know, tone down the, their, their accusations after spending a night in jail. And, and, and some of the same rulers that were saying crucify him concerning Jesus is part of the group that Peter and John are facing. Now, I should remind you that after Jesus' death, they were afraid of these same people. They were hiding behind locked doors. So you would think now they would be shaking in their boots, but not so. Because these guys are fearless. They asked Peter and John, by what power or what name did you heal this man? And in Acts, the fourth chapter, verse eight, Peter answers. Peter says, the, chapter eight, uh, NIV version, it says, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Y'all, these folk were like, Whoa, they, they couldn't figure out what to do with Peter and John. And, and so in verse 13, it says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. Well, Peter and John's courage was so profound that it stood out to the, the, the chief, the priests and the high officials. It stood out as astonishing. Evidently, they were not used to common folk 
displaying that kind of courage. It, it just wasn't the norm. You know, you can go read different stories in the Bible and see where when when it came to courage, people didn't have it. You know, the, the blind man that was healed. And they called his mother and, 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 and asked, asked his parents if he was blind, and, and, you know, if he was really blind. And, and they were like, we know he's our son. We know he was blind. But how he, got, how he got his sight, ask him. He's of age. Because they were fearful. But it wasn't the norm for common people. To display that kind of courage. But they realized that these men had been with Jesus. Maybe that's the key to their courage. That's the key to our courage. Key to that was the key to their fearlessness. They really didn't know the the the, the priests and, and, and the rulers, the counselors, they really didn't know what to do with them. Especially since the man who had been healed was there with him. Now, I don't know if he had gotten arrested too or if he just showed up for the trial because a lot of folk were there. But I would imagine this man has had less than 24 hours uh, or, or, or right at 24 hours uh, to out of over 40 years to be up walking. I would imagine that he was still jumping and walking and praising God and he was probably walking all night. <laughs> Can you imagine being born crippled and, and now to be over 40 and healed? My guess is that this man just walked the floors at night that night praising God. All of these dignitaries couldn't figure out what to do with Peter and John, these common men who had astonished them with their courage and had been with Jesus. And, and, and it's like the fact that they had been with Jesus gave them courage. The fact that they had seen a resurrected Christ gave them courage. They just knew, the, the, the officials just knew that we got to stop these folks. We got to stop them from talking about Jesus because people are starting to believe them. People, more and more people are believing them. Verse 18 says, then they called them in again. So what happened was they told Peter and John, they, they, and you know, if, it, and if it, there was any people around, they, they kind of cleared the room and they talked amongst themselves and they couldn't figure out what to do. So in verse 18, they called them back in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Now notice, they didn't just ask them in a nice way, you know, y'all, please don't talk about this man, Jesus. Don't, don't use that name again. No, they commanded them. And, and I would imagine that they commanded them with some uh, behind it. They commanded them not to speak or teach in that name again. Now, don't forget, we're talking about freedom from fear. And remember, they are talking to the same people. Peter and John are talking to the same people that were responsible for Jesus being crucified. Of course, we know that they weren't really responsible. Jesus gave his life. They didn't take it. They just thought they did. But these were the people that, that uh, from a human point of view, were responsible for Jesus being crucified. And verse 19 says, but Peter and John replied, Here's that boldness again. Here's that thing that astonished them. Here's that thing that let the the officials know that they had been with God, had been with Jesus. It says, but Peter and John said, judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about we have about what we have seen and heard. They literally didn't know what to do with Peter and John. 
And Peter and John are saying, we're not going to listen to you. We're not going to do what you say. It. We're not afraid of you. And so, so they're just baffled. So they threatened them some more, you know, tried to put a little bit more uh, in their threat. And eventually they let them go. Otherwise, if they had not, the mob would have dealt, they would have had to deal with the mob. After all their threats, telling uh, Peter and John not to teach or to preach in that name, what is the first thing that Peter and John do when they are released? They go back to the believers and tell them what had happened. And instead of the believers being fearful, you know how we would do like, Oh, y'all not, y'all shouldn't talk to, y'all shouldn't do that anymore. We need to be a little bit quieter. We need to, you know, all try, kinds of fearful things. But instead of being fearful and, 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 and locking the door and hiding behind the locked door like they once did, the Bible says that they raised their voices together in prayer. Verse 29 of the fourth chapter says, now, this is their prayer. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Y'all, do you hear this? They are asking for more boldness. They are asking God. They, they said, consider their threats and enable us to, be, to have great boldness in spite of their threats. Then the Bible says in verse 31, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. So, so they didn't ask God to, to do something to the folk so that they could be bold. They didn't say, uh, you know, arrest these people so that, that they won't bother us, clear the way for us. No, they said, consider them and give us great boldness and, and, and stretch out your hand and, and do even more than you've been doing. In the name of, of your holy servant, Jesus. They're asking for great boldness. And then God answers their prayers by shaking the house. And, and, and then the Holy Spirit fills them. And they, have the, they, they are able to speak the word of God boldly. Y'all, that is what freedom from fear looks like. Come back next time as we explore how Jesus' death and resurrection gives us, yes us, that kind of freedom from fear. Come back next time. See ya. Bye-bye.